Hello, and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Tobias Kopp. He is the regional manager for Central Europe for a hypergrowth scale up called Calibra. Tobias, welcome. Good afternoon, Marcus. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Would you mind giving the audience a 60 second rundown on your history so they get a sense of where you've come from? Of course. I'm in sales for over 20 years and have been selling really uh, everything from physical to services to projects as well as digital. In the past 15 years, I've been really helping SaaS scale up as as well as uh, big corporate uh, vendors to build and grow the DAC region of their enterprise business. And I've also been building and managing partner programs to just leverage a partner ecosystem to help strengthen strengthen the enterprise sales footprint in the region. Excellent. Thank you. Our conversation today is largely around why so many organizations fail when they move into Europe. And um, I'd like to explore both US and UK companies because I know both have problems, but in particular into the DAC region, which is Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Because... A lot of people see that as a very, very rich opportunity for them, but basically they die on their backside because they get it all wrong. So let me start with this. What are the common blind spots that you see inbound vendors having when they're trying to enter the European market and in particular the DAC region? So I think it is really important for companies to understand that the DAC region is quite different in terms of different cultures, different law systems. You find four different languages you need to cover as a, as a company in this region. So, And on top of that, also Germany and, and Austria are partly regulated also by EU law and regulations, uh, for instance, uh, around GDPR whereas uh, Switzerland is uh, following their own law and regulations and uh, explicitly staying out of the uh, European Union. So you find a very complex market uh, and region uh, in in the Dutch region here, uh, and you need to consider so many different things because you cannot just come from the thinking, we are probably a US-driven company and we will just uh, copy and paste what we've been uh, doing and exercising in in the previous time to the rest of the world and to the Dutch region. So what about cultural blind spots? Cultural blind spots is uh, probably one blind spot I would see is uh, relationship building. Uh, relationship building is a really important topic in the Dutch region and especially in a country like Switzerland. I would say that Switzerland probably, from my previous experience, uh, really requires the most effort in building trust and building up your your network before you can really start selling into those accounts. So building a strong relationship, creating trust by um, having many conversations, uh, educating the market is really, really key. But that also applies to, to Germany and Austria, of course. Those people, the people here are really heavily focusing on trust before they want to do business with you. And... What about hierarchy and qualifications? Because one thing I've noticed about Germans in particular is they often stay on in higher education a lot longer than we are used to in the UK. There's an alphabet behind many of their names, particularly if you're selling into engineering. So what are the blind spots when it comes to uh, understanding that culture of higher education and uh, respecting the hierarchy? That's a very good question, Marcus. So from my experience in terms of hierarchy uh, or more specifically also uh, personas you find in in Germany, the Germans uh, are really, as you might know, they're rather thinking towards a a problem than towards a solution. So uh, they are always thinking about, we have a problem here. So um, And they're not approaching their business uh, sometimes probably with a more uh, solution-focused approach like or U.S. customers would probably do this. So you'll find many people just focusing at first on on a problem rather than the the solution, really. So that's really something you have to think about. And also, especially the terms, they like their hierarchies. They they like their titles. 
you need to um, be able to talk to them in their own business terminology and, and language uh, to be really respected and to create trust uh, again so that they will be open uh, for a conversation with you. So in terms of building the relationship, what would you advise a US or UK company to do before they launch to ensure that they have a strong foundation and they don't come unstuck? I think there are several things to that. First, I think you need to have the understanding and also have the strategy that the Dach region, entering the Dach region, has to be a long term investment. You can't just expect to enter the region and close the first multi million deals in the first couple of quarters. So you need to have that um, strategy uh, and the backing and the support also by senior management, by the board, by the investors to invest over a long period of time. To build that market, to grow that market, uh, you need to invest at least two to three years in, from a timing perspective. But also, on the other hand, I believe you also need to hire the right uh, people to do this. Probably in the, in the beginning, uh, you might use the northern region, so UK, as a first level to reach out into the dark region, which uh, works fine uh, most of the times, I think. At a specific later point, you will uh, realize that you need to have local people speaking native tongue, having the local understanding of, of the culture and the dark region and the differences, uh, bringing their own network. And you need to start also having people uh, localized uh, in Germany, probably in Austria, but also Switzerland. It's really important to have local people there and also bring uh, the other team members like pre-sales, like marketing, uh, customer success management onto a local level. One of the things I've observed is there are a lot of companies that are trying to start up in Berlin, but that doesn't seem to be a great resource pool in terms of IT sales or technical skills. What is it that's drawing people to Berlin instead of places like Munich, Frankfurt, Stuttgart? Is it just because it's the capital and uh, the allure of the lights and Kofustendam and various other fun stuff? <laughs> yeah, probably. I think from an outside uh, perspective, Berlin is a very, very modern, glamorous city with a lot of history, of course, and you find many, many really young and creative people in Berlin. However, um, if looking at this from a pure business perspective, I think rarely find the big uh, corporates, so the prospects, the customers being located in Berlin. That's one uh, issue I see with locating your first uh, office in Berlin, probably, but also what I see a little bit critical about Berlin is if you are looking for the right resources in terms of uh, uh, revenue and operations, that might be an issue because usually you find those people more in the area of like uh, Munich or, or Frankfurt or Dusseldorf because you, you already have other big and, and smaller SaaS companies being located in this region and they, they probably be looking to move into a different company sooner at a sooner or later stage of their career. However, if you're looking for more kind of creative or developer pool of people, Berlin might be a good place to start because there are so many startups sitting there, but they are mainly around really uh, the development uh, development you need in the beginning to, to uh, program a solution, to create a solution. Uh, I know you've got a, a strong background in channel. Does it make sense for people who are looking to break into the Dach region to maybe uh, look at a channel launch strategy rather than trying to set up locally? Absolutely. I think utilizing a partner and uh, channel ecosystem is really very important uh, doing business in this uh, region. Might not be talking about the real, real big uh, partners only, but also finding more boutique partners and uh, channel partners uh, in countries like Switzerland or Austria might be a very good uh, starting point because 
they have been doing business for many, many years already with the, uh, the prospects you're looking at and really helping those partners, making them more valuable for their customers by having another great solution to offer, giving them enough support um, and really helping them to create a new business jointly with you. That might be a very uh, critical and important element to really entering the Dach region. In terms of shortcutting that whole process of building trust, I think you've made the point extremely eloquently that these partners already have established customer relationships. They're already known to them. I think what I see very often is that vendors try to land in a country thinking that their success in the US or their success in the UK will carry them. But in your experience, when vendors have tried to do that, what is the normal uh, response from German end users? So I think one of the first questions or um, probably also objections uh, you will find uh, with uh, customers in this region is, tell me, uh, dear company, dear software vendor, show me your best practice, show me your success stories from our market, from our business. It's nice uh, to have your big shiny success stories from your US customers. That's great. But we really also would like to see uh, how you implemented this on a more local, uh, regional level here. And really having those success stories, building those uh, success stories, bringing the best practice from other customers more down to a regional level is, is really also very important because they want to find themselves again in those success stories they, because we are so different uh, from, from a legal system point of view, from, from a use case point of view probably compared to other regions. Although you probably find not as many really globally uh, established uh, companies and brands in, in a country like uh, Germany compared to, uh, let's say, the US, where, where you have really the big, big uh, global brands like uh, Nike, Coca-Cola, etc. You don't have that big volume here in Germany. So let's take Switzerland, first of all. Obviously, you've got the German, you've got the Italian, and you have the French markets there. How often do you find US and UK companies coming unstuck because of that? Very often. And from what I've experienced in the past is, it might sound funny, but even if you're uh, coming uh, more from a northern part of Germany and trying to talk to someone in Switzerland, you'll probably find le less acceptance to have an uh, ongoing discussion with them as uh, when you're coming more from a southern part of, of Germany, like from the Munich area, because it's really the distance, but also it's kind of the similarity in, 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 the, in the culture. You're coming from, from, a, from the countryside, you're coming from, from the Alps, you're very close to each other. So having uh, someone from, from Bavaria, let's say, talking to someone uh, in Switzerland might work more often than uh, having someone from really Hamburg or Berlin trying to do business with someone in Switzerland. However, I've also been working a lot in Switzerland in the previous years and also have to say the best setup for Switzerland really be to have a local person uh, being uh, located in Switzerland somewhere in the area of Zurich or Geneva or Basel. That uh, really depends on where you want to start. But having someone who, who used to live in Switzerland already, who is probably well known in, in his own network there might be the, the most optimal starting point. So from a recruitment standpoint, what advice would you give in order to recruit either that individual or that partner to identify someone who or an organization that has the right kind of network and background? I would uh, directly start looking for people in Switzerland, either utilize headhunting network or you have uh, your recruiting team reaching out to people who are seem to be a good fit from their previous experience and history for a sales career in, in Switzerland. And so what kind of research can you do to establish whether someone really has a network of any substance versus cl just claiming they have one? 
that's where it becomes a little bit tricky because everyone seems to have uh, 500 plus contacts on LinkedIn today. And it's hard to tell, of course, are those real contacts and, and is this a good re- network and relationship you can trust or is this just accept by default kind of thing? I think you really need to talk uh, to those people and get them talking about how they approach building relationships, how they have been doing this successfully in the past, what challenges and roadblocks they have been experiencing just by talking with them, getting a really good understanding if they are a good relationship builder. Because uh, if you get the feeling that someone is really good in having a conversation and building relationships, this person might be on the more positive side of uh, that uh, you can trust uh, that his existing network is really uh, real and, and solid. So on balance, does it make more sense to go for a partner as your first point of entry rather than an individual? It depends on really what partner you're talking about, Marcus. Is this more a a reselling partner? Is this more a consulting partner? Okay. Because, again, obviously you have the transacting type of partner and then you have the technical partner. But if you're trying to expand a market, presumably most will be looking for one that has a good sales operation because they want to be generating pipeline, building a customer base. So again, is there any advice that you can give in terms of being able to identify whether a prospective partner is one that you want to put a ring on their finger because they are uh, actually effective at selling? So what I've uh, seen and experienced in the past is that you really have to go through a very deep qualification process, of course, with those partners, just as uh, you would uh, uh, do during your prospecting with your, with your customers. So you really need to understand who are the good partners you want to go for and which you want to connect with. And probably you, you might already bring some relationships, international relationships from other countries with you that uh, you've been already uh, working with, let's say, Accenture or uh, Capgemini in other regions, and uh, you could uh, utilize their local um, presence in the Dach region just to build up on that. If you are looking to to, um, partner with new partners you want to work with, you should really look into what uh, customers and uh, industries and solution space they serve in, as well as if you are really able to educate and and train them, because this is something those partners will ask uh, for a lot. And I think this is uh, really very important. You have to be able, of course, uh, today, due to the uh, pandemic situation we're in right now, you can do this more uh, virtually. But anyways, those partners will look for and ask for, for a lot of onboarding, training, education, so that you enable them to really go and um, help yourself talk to customers. So and then the whole en- enablement part in building a relationship with a partner is uh, really very important. When I was doing the original research for making channel sales work, when we were writing that, one of the most important themes that the 60 or so people that we interviewed were making to us was how important it was that you were good and you were set up to be a good partner. And again, I suspect this you've got a few interesting war stories where vendors have come into the Dach region and they have failed to establish themselves as a good partner. And they kind of expected the partners to do all the heavy lifting. In your experience, what have been the reasons why Vendors coming into a region trying to sell through partners have failed. One of the reasons why they might have failed is uh, probably, as you already said, they let the partner do all the heavy lifting. Uh, They will just uh, run them through a good or not so good uh, certification and onboarding process, give them a high quota to start working on, but then leave them just alone without um, any more support and really having no solid partner program in place is really 
not helping those those partners as well to be, to be successful with you. So you need to make sure that you can supply them with the right deliverables. Uh, you need to be able to uh, provide them with the enablement and, and onboarding uh, material and information. You need to be able to make resources, let's say from uh, pre-sales or also from your sales team available to them to jointly execute on, on customer, customer uh, site meetings and presentations uh, with them. Also, I think another point where companies seem to fail is not really talking the local tongue, especially in terms of marketing deliverers. You will see many comp- companies just translating U.S. originally um, generated um, deliverables like website or white paper or a blog, just translating this one-to-one into the uh, local language but uh, having really no context at all to uh, the local local expectations from customers, uh, local use cases, and uh, more the typical language uh, those customers when they're talking about their business. So uh, they might not be talking about digital transformation or velocity in, in, in content or, or whatever. You need to find the right terms also on the, on the, on the marketing side. Having said that, so putting the right deliverables in place in the in the markets and really talking in, in a local tongue, but also providing enough uh, support, providing enough uh, resources to your your partners is is really important to to be successful. Okay, I think it's worth building on what Tobias has just said. You've got to make sure that you communicate clearly. You have to make sure that you keep your word. If you're entering any market and if you're selling anything to anyone, um, you're known by the promises you keep, not the ones that you make. Uh, But I suspect in Germany and uh, Switzerland and Austria, it's a particularly high requirement that you don't make promises you don't intend to keep. Because first of all, letting people down is a bad sign. But secondly, I suspect these people will talk. And they'll, you, you will very quickly develop a reputation for not sticking to your, your word. The other element is that you need to work towards a win-win or no deal. And you've got to make sure that you're up front. If, um, I think um, one of the things that I've noticed in my dealings uh, with uh, German clients historically is they appreciate your candor. If you honestly can't do something, they would much rather know that up front. Uh, than find it out later whilst you've tried to you know, stick things together with sticky tape and staples. And understand what your partner's requirements are, what they are trying to achieve, and do everything that you can in order to help them achieve their goals. And if you're going to recruit a partner, make sure you understand the type of partner that you are courting are they technical? Are they a sales organization? Are they a 360 house that does everything from start to finish? And don't go in expecting a technical partner to be great at selling. They're not. They're very good at technical stuff, but they probably can take an order well. They can't necessarily open up a market or open up an account. They may be able to introduce you to their limited set of customers, but if you're expecting them to be an expansion house and you know, th- th- this great engine that's going to drive your pipeline, that's very unlikely to happen. And so, again, I think other elements are regular communication and honest feedback, a cadence of accountability, making sure that you map out what the expectations are, that you have a proper onboarding process. Once you've gone through the flirt and you've decided to put a ring on each other's finger, then make sure that there is regular communication, regular accountability, and make sure that everyone in the team is engaging with the right people within the partner organization. Would that be a fair summary of things that many organizations miss? Absolutely, Marcus. That's a great summary. Probably, um, as you've been mentioning also to the risk of over-promise and under-deliver, I think also on the At the point when you've been uh, closing a deal, uh, you really need to make sure that you provide continuous support and communication to your partner, but also, of course, to your customer, to your new customer. 
what I've seen in the past is that the uh, customer success organization has been really been burning out because of uh, just being uh, overloaded with uh, too many customers, too many new projects. Then the ship basically started sinking. And also, as you uh, said absolutely correctly, customers start talking. This is a very small network, uh, basically, uh, like in Switzerland. If you are trying to uh, enter the fin space, everyone knows each other and they talk on a frequent basis about their business stuff. And what goes around comes around. So really, if, if you are not doing a great job also in execu- execution and uh, delivering on your promise, you will not find uh, a very good potential market in, in front of you anymore. Well. This then raises yet another really important question, which is that if you are going into a marketplace, then whichever market it is in Europe, and Dach in particular, you need to understand the culture of how people do business. In the US, people are often going to be quite guarded about what's going on. But within job functions, we know that procurement people regularly speak to one another and they talk about their experience. And you know, you, you've got to make sure that you are not creating a minefield for yourself. So again, tell the truth always. Get ahead of problems. And this is a really important lesson that people, uh, in fact, there are two really important lessons. The first one is that Unhappy customers will always be looking around. Satisfied customers are always open to an approach. A satisfied customer could quite easily throw you into a bid situation when renewal is up, because if someone comes with a marginal gain, it's worth their while to explore it. And so delighted customers don't. What they do is they come to the vendor and they say, XYZ company has come to us. They're offering this. Can you do it? And so it's really important that that regular cadence of communication is in place. The other point that I'd like to make, and I I learned this from Bob Master, and um, his fabulous book, uh, book, Demand Side Sales, is really worth a read. But he talks about how customers hire your solution. They don't buy it outright. They hire it for as long as it delivers the outcome that they want. And you need to start thinking like that. Uh, Customers are not forever. You have to keep earning the right to have them come back, renew, expand. And in the DAH region in particular, I get the sense that that's very much the mentality of buyers, that it's temporary, but if they're getting brilliant service, and they're getting a solution, they're very loyal. Would that be a fair identification of what goes on in that market? Absolutely. I 100% uh, agree, Marcus. And I think we, as salespeople, we have to uh, sell the outcome. We don't have to sell the solution. We are selling the outcome. We have to heavily focus on the benefits and how the solution will improve the customer's uh, business, uh, how it will increase their revenue, how this will differentiate them uh, from their competition. I think that that's very important. But also what I've been realizing over the past couple of years is also the mentality, how companies uh, want to buy is changing more and more. You need to think about a more uh, buyer first approach, especially in, in our special times we are living in right now with the pandemic as uh, most of the business has been shifted to digital and and virtual, you have to think really about how does your audience want to buy from you? What's their expectation uh, in terms of processes and and, uh, steps? And you have to adapt to that. Again, I I strongly recommend that people look at uh, Bob Mester's book because in there he has, he's mapped out a buying cycle that buyers are going through, the first thing they do is they realize that there is a a problem. And so what they do is they start making space and they have a first thought. And they start sniffing around and passively looking and learning how they might be able to solve their problem. And as the problem builds, they start seeing possibilities. And they start looking actively. 
And then they start to look at making trade-offs. ABC company does flip it, flap it, and flop it. XYZ company does flop it, flap it, and fidgetbidoo, or whatever. And so they start making these trade-offs. What do we have to compromise? And they make their decision on the basis of what they have disqualified. And this is really interesting because it actually aligns very closely with how we as sellers need to think, which is we need to disqualify out the non-opportunities and the non-prospects and the wrong prospects early so we can concentrate our energy and effort on the opportunities that we can win and we should win. And then they start to use it and they make progress. If they're not making progress, they'll drop it like a hot brick. If they do make progress through ongoing use, then they start to build a buying habit. And this is, again, ties in very neatly with the whole concept that they are just hiring your solution because the habit will continue for as long as it delivers the outcome that they're paying for. The moment it doesn't or something else comes along that offers them a better outcome or their conditions have changed, you need to adapt. And this is where we need to start thinking very differently as sellers. Gone are the days where you can show up, vomit up a few uh, product features, and maybe make a sale. Companies are very savvy nowadays. And particularly through COVID, they've had to really tighten their belts. They're focused on how can you help me solve problems across multiple departments. And you need to be partnering with the end user. You need to be partnering with procurement. You need to be partnering with your partners and even sometimes your competition so that you can help your customer solve their problem in its entirety. They're probably already aware of the symptoms, if not the pain. They may not quite understand the cause, but just turning up and feature benefiting them to death is not going to work. Just turning up and putting them into a pain funnel and beating them over the head with their pain isn't going to work. You need to be a strategic partner and you need to be by their side, helping them along the way to evaluate, helping them to understand the root cause of their problem. Now, procurement is in the unique position of having all these problems thrown over the wall to them and finance and operations and IT and marketing and sales and customer success are all throwing problems over the wall to procurement. They are the one department in the company who gets visibility of all of the problems at once. And to pick up on Tobias's point, if you are going to enter into the DAC market, it makes a good deal of sense to spend probably 12 to 18 months pre-launch engaging with those procurement people early to understand, first of all, what's going on, how they like to buy, what their priorities are, and how they are changing, but also to sow the seeds in terms of if you see this pattern of events happening, that is when you should be bringing in our partner to have a conversation about how we might be able to help you. And then you can pick up all the business and you'll get long-term business out of them instead of picking up the scraps and just the occasional bit. Because technology vendors are just one moving part in the machine of IT. So in security, you might be one of 12 or 20 different vendors, which in turn is just one component in all of their IT strategy all of which is there to underpin the business's strategy. And if you are not partnering with procurement, if you are not engaging in conversations with the board about what their strategy is, then when you enter that market, you will be spending a lot of time using your fingernails to try and claw your way up the organization and meeting a lot of resistance because you haven't earned the right to sell to them. Is that a fair uh, statement? Absolutely. Great. As we look at a company that has managed to get a foothold in the DAC region, can you think of examples of companies that have been able to expand their reach 
really effectively? And what was it about their strategy and the people that they had on the ground that really made them stand apart from the others uh, who maybe are just sort of surviving or grow briefly and then collapse, fade out? I think one thing I've seen which worked very good for those companies is uh, to hire really experienced, more senior people in the beginning rather uh, than putting uh, young young salespeople, BDRs into the region, really building more on the, on the, the senior level because they will bring the experience and, and all, all the uh, knowledge and also, of course, uh, network with them and uh, ha- will bring the understanding of how to build out that team, which people, uh, people to hire to do the job in the region. I think uh, that's uh, something people have been doing quite well um, in the past. And uh, probably another point which uh, always worked out uh, very well is when uh, companies, as you mentioned before, already had a, a long-term strategy and understanding of, of the market. If they just uh, didn't try to fast start into the region by just uh, Telling a, a few sellers, uh, probably sitting in the UK office, reach out to the companies in, in Germany and Switzerland and Austria and uh, get them on the phone or get them on the video to, to, to run them to a product presentation, do a demo, and then start selling. I think you need to invest a lot of more time. And as you said before, give it at least 12 to 18 months uh, to really do your research, do your homework about uh, market, industries, companies, personas, culture, all that stuff you you need to build up on uh, at a later later point of time. There are two resources that I would strongly recommend people explore. One is a fabulous resource called Going Global on a Shoestring by uh, a guy called Hans-Peter Bech. And it's a recent release. And uh, Hans Peter was involved in the growth of a company called Navision, which at the time was probably the largest acquisition in the uh, the history of IT. Now, this was back in the early 2000s, late 1990s. And in fact, he's written another book called 5,460 Miles from Silicon Valley. And this was a, a Danish ERP vendor who grew, first of all, through Germany uh, and then into the US. And he maps out there the story, and it still holds true for companies that are trying to expand into the DAC region, but also to accelerate their hypergrowth. And the other is a chap called Zach, Z-A-C-H, Selch, S-E-L-C-H. And uh, Zach is a fascinating character. He's a good Jewish boy from Chicago who has been working with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the last 30 years. He's opened up a 1,000 partnerships plus over 135 countries, and he's created a video series about cultural awareness, and he offers his service as a route to market to drive explosive international growth. You can find him on globalsalesmentor.com. Strong recommendation that you look at his videos and you connect with Zach because he is incredibly culturally aware and very, very smart at helping you to generate productive, viable partner relationships that produce pipeline quickly, even before you've got the legal terms and conditions properly completed. And I think it's really important as well. A lot of US companies, and you see this with a lot of UK companies as well, they're so fixated on having this war and peace thick level of uh, contract in place. But the reality is you want to see what's under their kimono before you start wasting uh, tens of thousands of dollars on legal uh, fees. Go out and find the right kind of partner and create the conditions for them to actually go out and start building pipeline and do whatever you can to help them be successful. And I see this all the time when people go out to market and they're looking at growing through their partners. They kind of expect the partner can sell. In my experience, a lot of partners cannot sell. They're very good at taking orders. 
many of them, if you ask them how they generate their business, they build it through referral, which is great, but they don't have a referral system. What they've been doing is trading off longstanding relationships because they've been around for years or decades, and they're not good at landing and expanding. What they're very good at is keeping existing customers. And you need to be really savvy in terms of your pre-qualification phase to make sure that you're getting the right partners. And if they're not a sales organization, you have to help them to sell. I see this. I'm working with a couple of software vendors as chief revenue officer. And one of the things that we've committed to our partners is that we will train them. So every Monday morning, we have a training session on how to sell our products. And then we have unlimited coaching for when they need help. We're producing assets to help them produce their marketing collateral. We're getting their messaging right by region. So we're spending a lot of time and money investing in the messaging for the individual markets that we're uh, opening up. We midwife deals with them. So we help them to qualify. Uh, We help them to disqualify as well because getting out of the, the wrong pursuit is like saving a goal in football. And too few vendors are willing to have those conversations with their partners because the channel manager wants to look like they've got a full fat pipeline. I would rather have nothing in the pipeline because nothing is real uh, than fill it up with rubbish because that just sucks up resource and mismatches the expectation that you're sending to your senior leadership team, your board and your investors. So let's talk about the malpractice, the bad practices that technology firms exhibit in the DAH region that drive distrust because of how investors are expecting software vendors to behave in the market. What are the mistakes in behavior and management that you see being forced on the sales team that perhaps uh, do more harm than good? As we are all coming from from a revenue-driven business and uh, specifically from a quarterly-based driven business. I think uh, this is uh, one of the biggest mistakes all the investors might uh, tend to do to uh, just focus too much on on each each quarter and not having the the long term view and the the vision they need if they want to invest in a in a new region like the Dutch region. So coming from a highly efficient uh, revenue organization from the US, which is uh, already running very fast, bringing a lot of revenue into a region which is not at the same uh, pace and volume already and just putting the same pace and also the same pressure on, onto that region uh, just to align to corporate goals and uh, corporate objectives. And, uh, of course, revenue planning is something where I've seen uh, that's not good for, for building and growing a region and it's also not good uh, f- from an investor's point of view because they will not be able to achieve their quarterly targets with a, such a short-term thinking. So as a general manager, what pushback do you have to give to investors and to U.S. management so that you're establishing clear, realistic expectations? And how badly is that? I think think one habit and good skill uh, you should have in this position is being a very good communicator. You should uh, be able to tell the, the, the story, show the outlook, and show the consistency how you are trying and working on building uh, the market and building uh, the business in the region. You need to talk to uh, all the different kinds of people, to your direct uh, managers, to the board, probably also reach out to the board, to the investors, to just show the whole story and um, explain how this is going to build up over the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, uh, 24 months, and beyond. Communication and being able to tell that story 
to outline your, your mid and long term strategy, I think is, is a key skill you need. It sounds to me like what you also need is a lot of buy in and that long term commitment from the board. And without that, it's almost guaranteed that you will fail. Yes, I would definitely agree. So if you were advising somebody who was considering a general manager role for the region, what would you advise them to say and do in the interview process to ensure that they didn't buy a poison chalice for a job? I'm a person who always who is always straightforward and um, very transparent and honest. And uh, what I always like to do is I say, I will not tell you a dream here. I will tell you how the reality, I will put you uh, in front of the reality and uh, I will be able to to achieve that with your, your support and backup. But I'm a, not the type of guy who is just building a dream pipeline, uh, which is ju- just uh, dust and smoke after 12 months because it didn't show the reality and it didn't show the, the long-term investment. So I think companies need to find uh, people, they need to find managers who will have already the experience and the, the skill to work on, on really exhausting sales cycles through a lot of investment into markets building a team, hiring the right resources, and um, also building a trustworthy and transparent and solid uh, pipeline. Okay. One thing I have observed, and before we move into wrapping up, is very often first-time founders don't really know what they don't know. Again, I'm sure that there will be exceptions to this, but if you're looking at expanding into the Dach region, and you're looking at taking on a general management role, would you necessarily be more or less comfortable if they were first-time founders, or do they need to have a couple of failures under their belt and have tried to break into uh, the DAH region before, and they've got some scar tissue for you to be more confident to take that role? I think it's uh, definitely more beneficial if uh, they've already uh, failed one or more times, because I think and hopefully they've gotten their learnings um, uh, and thoughts from from that process, whereas uh, first-time founders m- might be just too, too uh, excited, overexcited, and uh, and really, uh, yeah, not bringing that that uh, experience from from previous adventures uh, they already ha- uh, have. But I, I don't want to exclude them and say, okay, I would just go with. Uh, Serial entrepreneurs and and uh, knowing those those people have done this over and over again and they they know what they are doing. It's also uh, always a matter of how open and yeah open are those uh, founders and and leaders in terms of uh, accepting their special conditions and and the uh, long term strategy the strategy they they might need. I think to summarize, it's really about finding mature leadership that is willing to take the advice of the people who they are hiring, who know their region intimately, and making sure that they establish clear, realistic expectations. It doesn't mean you can't be ambitious, but it does absolutely mean that um, they need to have a mature leadership team that recognizes that expanding into this market is difficult. There are the corpses of many failed businesses uh, littering the battlefield. And you you have to be prepared to play the long game. Is that fair? Yes, yes, absolutely. You have to trust your people. You invest in trust. Absolutely. Oh, I like that line, you invest in trust. I think something else that's really important is that you have to recruit for uh, what you cannot train. And that's really important when you're building the team. Tell me this, what, what are you struggling with, Tobias? What are you wrestling with at the moment? <laughs> I think the biggest uh, change in our business right now is really uh, the pandemic situation we're in right now. You have seen that uh, companies have been uh, putting the foot on the brake in the, in the beginning of the year, just being very sensitive about uh, what harm uh, the whole new situation might be doing to their business. They've been freezing budgets. Uh, they've been 
lengthening the conversations and the, uh, and uh, processes. However, this, uh, the speed is picking up again, and I see definitely that this might be ha having even a more uh, positive impact in the future because this, as bad as, as it is the situation we're in right now, that this really was kind of the right uh, kick into the in the right direction in terms of digital transformation and uh, speeding uh, things up and even in investing more money now into software and services. I think what I'm saying is that if it's urgent and important, the sales cycles have shortened. If it's unnecessary or frivolous spend, it's completely off the shelf. And if it's a nice to have, then the sales cycles have extended. You need to be able to establish whether where you fit in that framework. And if you can't find a way to make what you have urgent or important, then you've got to be ready to make the long-term investment. And you've got to look at ways that you can rationalize, drive down your cost, but also where you can deliver quick wins across multiple areas of the business, multiple departments. And you need to rethink your approach. And if you are trying to sell technology for technology's sake, and I see this happen all the time with vendors, they're desperate to try and race to a demo. And the only people who look at demos early in the sales cycle are people who cannot buy. They are engineers who want to see a new shiny piece of tech. They may be procurement who have a vague interest in something. What they're more often than not doing is establishing what you can do so they can go to their preferred supplier and beat them up to see if they can offer you uh, offer them something similar without having to change vendor. So tell me this, you've got a golden ticket and you could magically go back in time and you could have advised the idiot 23-year-old Tobias. What one bit of advice would you give him that he would have probably ignored but would have been useful? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> Is that because there are so many? <laughs> I'm not sure if I, if I would enjoy uh, being able to go back in time because you never know what you change and what impact that has on, on your future. But probably I think uh, one thing I would have been doing different is putting more focus on, on what, what I really want to achieve from a personal point of view, but also from a business point of view and put a little bit more effort in really thinking that through and uh, g getting an understanding uh, where do I see myself in, in the next five years, 10 years, et cetera, if that is uh, possible at, at all, really. However, when I look back at my career, it has been just a real uh, personal development. I've been, uh, as I said, I've been selling physical products, digital products, different kinds of, kinds of stuff. So where I am right now is because I've been doing this exactly li li like I did. So it is what it is. So that's why I say I'm not quite sure if I would really change something. <laughs> okay. Um, tell me this. What, what have you been reading, watching, listening to that you, has really influenced you or you feel other people should pay attention to because it's great material that they can apply and implement? So generally, I read a lot of books about sales strategies and methodologies. I just like that stuff and uh, to understand the differences and how to use uh, use that in your daily daily business. Because I think it's not there is not the one and only uh, methodology. It's really a combination, and it's really uh, hardly dependent on the situation you're in right when selling and uh, at what stage you are in. But also, I, I really enjoy reading. A, books on the psychological side of our business. I read a lot of books from investigators or, or um, also forensic specialists just to, to know how to read and how to, under, how to really uh, understand people. Uh, and uh, when you're entering a conversation, when you're entering a, a negotiation, there are so many nitty gritty details you can get out of those situations uh, how they talk how they act how they behave or don't behave so i like reading books about that would give one recommendation one uh, one book um, i just uh, recently read is uh, about facts and figures um, about uh, our planet and our 
world we're we're living in, and that helped me really to kind of have more trust that everything is going to be even better than it uh, has been in the, in the past. And the title of the book is Factfulness. It's from a gentleman called Hans Rosling. He's uh, uh, he's a, a scientist, and uh, this book is full of facts and uh, statistics around where this entire world and evolution started and where where we are right now and uh, it gave me so much uh, trust and positivity back to really survive thank you a couple of things that uh, resources i think you will definitely enjoy i would look up a chap on linkedin called simon bowen and he's the models guy and he has the models method and i think you'll really appreciate that i would also definitely check out a company called corporate visions their research is just stunning. And uh, two key people there are Eric Peterson and Tim Reisterer. And uh, their ebooks are really worth reading. And also, I would look at their YouTube videos. Simon Bowen's uh, videos are fabulous. And I would also recommend Colin Shaw. Colin runs a branding business, but he really understands the human condition exceptionally well. And his uh, blog is fantastic. And uh, he has a company called Beyond Philosophy that's really worth paying attention to. And I would also look at Mark Schaefer. Uh, he wrote a book called Marketing Rebellion, and that's about humanizing our marketing and humanizing our sales, which I think is something we haven't touched on today, but I think it's really important. Too much emphasis has gone on automation, and we've sacrificed effectiveness and humanity for efficiency. And um, I see so much marketing wasted. And in fact, it just becomes an unwelcome interruption. And then that feeds into the BDR conversations. And is there any wonder that you see such heavy uh, levels of burnout? How can people get hold of you, Tobias? Always happy to connect uh, on, on LinkedIn. This is the, the main network I really use. Um, I'm also uh, on Xing, of course, but uh, LinkedIn is really the network I'm working on. Uh, mainly, uh, just shoot me a message, probably uh, a nice a little intro. Uh, it's always uh, appreciated. And um, yeah, you'll find me there. So on that subject around LinkedIn versus Zing, I know Zing has a strong foothold entering into the German market. Would you suggest that people develop a network in Zing so that it's, they're starting to get a better understanding of the DACH region? It depends on uh, what kinds of uh, customers you're focusing on. If you're talking about uh, enterprises, I would definitely not go for Zing because Zing, uh, from my experience, is uh, good for more small, medium business uh, companies, but uh, the big brands and the big companies and the big networks of those companies, you will definitely find much more on LinkedIn. So I would always rather uh, start with LinkedIn. Also, in terms of using tools, which I love, uh, like uh, Sales Navigator um, on LinkedIn, this is just a great, great tool, very, very uh, solid for pipeline building. So uh, that, that's what you don't find on, on Xing. Excellent. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Xing, it's xing.com. Yeah. Yes. Tobias Kopp, thank you. Marcus, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Always good speaking with you. Excellent. This is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this enlightening and helpful, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you are interested in entering into the German or the Dach market, then please do get in touch with either me or with Tobias. And also remember Zach Seltz, he's got a great pedigree of working within uh, the international market. In the meantime, if you want to get hold of me, then please email me at marcus at laughs and stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.